okay. Um, I'm gonna get started because it's the last talk of the day. Everybody probably wants to go get a drink. I want to go get a drink. <laughs> Is there after parties? Does anybody know? Yeah. All right, cool. Thanks. Somebody grab me and take me to one. <laughs> um, so you can yell at me for this talk. So um, this talk, I originally wanted to talk about um, lenses and traversable. Um, yeah, <laughs> but it turned out that, um, you know, I've given a couple similar talks, and if you've seen um, uh, me talk at HTML5 Dev Comp before, I've, I've spoken about point free and um, type classes, and this is kind of a mixture of all that. I don't think I could have uh, written a talk about anything else because it's, people are still trying to get their heads wrapped around this, and, and I guess I am too, and I don't want to go too far without hitting the basics. So I'm um, pretty much going to talk about uh, point-free programming and type classes all in the context of underscore. Um, so yeah, and I'm going to bash underscore like crazy, you guys. <laughs> not really. Not, not. So OK, so I, I do love underscore. I think it's great. Um, so I'm not, I'm not here to make fun of it or say it's terrible or be like, low dash rules and you know, it doesn't work on Node and things like that. Um, so uh, I am here to talk about uh, functional programming. And uh, I think that underscore does a terrible job of, of saying functional. Or, you know, it says it's functional, but it's not really um, when you compare it to a real functional language. Um, and you know, I'll, I'll read blog posts all the time on things like, oh, yeah, here's the functional way. This means I'm passing arguments around, and I'm really verbose, and it's basically procedural. But that's what you know, I think the perception of functional programming is. Um, and it's getting better and better every year. Uh, but underscore is marketing themselves saying that they have uh, these, these functions. Um, and I want to examine that and kind of take a close look at what you would really do uh, and compare that to what underscore is doing um, so we could see what turns out, you know, it can be a beautiful paradigm. All right, so the agenda is currying, composition, functors, and random stuff. Um, so if you already know all this stuff, I won't be offended if you leave because <laughs> we're going to go over it. OK, so currying. Um, I just put that in there to wake you guys up because it's like the last talk of the day and it's really exciting background. <laughs> uh, so currying is just a function that takes, uh, keeps returning a new function until it gets all its arguments. Um, and we can look at that a little bit closer here. So with this function add, um, I should point out these type signatures are just comments. Um, we've been working on a type parser, but haven't gotten too far. <laughs> so uh, with add, uh, we take x and we return a new function that takes the y, and then we add them together. And uh, you can call it. We have add three, and when we call add with three, we we say that's partially applying it with three. Then we get a new function back, and that function we can call with four. And we'll get seven. And we can call it again with five and get eight. So it's like it made us a new function. Uh, we just gave it an argument and we got a new function back. Um, and then we have this like weird butt looking thing if we try to call it all together. And that's not cool. Um, so Woo.js has an awesome uh, function called auto curry. And in auto curry, you basically, you can just keep throwing arguments at a function and it'll just keep returning you a function. Uh, until it gets all its arguments. So you can see there in the bottom, they're just like parentheses and you know, any combination you can think of, and you still get a function back until it gets all its arguments. Uh, so we've just stolen that function and extended the function prototype with it. Uh, so now um, with uh, add, you can just slap auto curry at the end. And when we call add three there, uh, we get a new function back that's just waiting for its last argument. And it works just like before, um, except we don't have that weird butt looking thing. It's just you can call it all together. So awesome. Um, oh, I should also say just raise your hand or walk up to the mic if you have any questions. Um, and if you're taking that class in a couple days, you'll probably see a couple of these slides over and over again. So, um, But they'll be way more in depth. <laughs> OK, so here's another example. Um, full name. Full name takes uh, three arguments here. So we can call it with Hunter S. Thompson. And we get the name out. Um, or we can call it just with the first. Um, and so we get this new function called bill something. Uh, and that's waiting for its middle and last. And if we give it that, we get Bill Cosby out. So, um, and here's another one. We can call bill something with just the middle name. And 
Uh, we'll get Bill Clinton if we give it the last. So you can pretty much keep giving it arguments piecemeal if you want. Um, this is just an example of like how you can use it to get a feel for it. So why would we do this? <laughs> well, all right, so here's a function called modulo. Uh, and if you've ever used modulo before, um, you know, you pretty much are going to call it with two, <laughs> I think. That's what I do. Um, so we can make a new function down there called is odd just by partially applying modulo with the number two. And it comes out with zero if it's uh, even and one if it's odd. So <laughs> it's true or false. Uh, so that's, that's a pretty cool application of it. We've got a new function that's pretty useful just by partially applying modulo. And here's another example. We've got this function filter. And uh, all it's doing is wrapping the native filter. Uh, but uh, if we call it with is odd, you know, it runs. And if we partially apply it with is odd, we get a whole new function back. Uh, and uh, that's pretty useful. It'll always get the odd, odd numbers out of the array. Um, but what's crazy here is is odd is partially applied itself, right? So you have a partially applied is odd with a partially applied filter, and we've got a, a third function out of that that's really useful. So um, this stuff is, you know, you're building new functions by giving functions arguments. So let's look at an example of that. And here's where we're going to examine the underscore way. Um, so let's take a second to digest this. <laughs> So you have a, we're going to call this with first two letters here, um, or that's our function name. And it'll just run through an array and return us the first two letters uh, back. Can everybody see the comment to doubt one? Is that cool? Um, so looking at this, we've got a function that takes words. We're going to map over those words. And for every word, uh, we're going to grab the first two. Uh, so I don't know, uh, an underscore of the two is optional, but we're going to pretend it's not here. <laughs> So we, uh, we can rewrite this in a way more functional way. Um, let's leave the top one for reference there. So here, uh, if, we, if we just examine this, um, if, if this function took its arguments in the other order, we could partially apply it with two. And that would be pretty useful, uh, because then it would be a function just waiting for its word. And if we just take that word off, we could put it in place of this whole function wrapper here, since it is a function waiting, waiting for a word. So does that make sense? You guys with me? We've just flipped the arguments, and now this is a function. Since it's partially applied, it'll just get each of these words and run. And actually, it turns out that map, uh, if we flip this, then this would be a function. These words and these words kind of match up, and we can just take this off. Now it's a function waiting for words. So there we go. And that's all we needed. So um, it's, it's pretty cool with this currying and partial application thing. If underscore did that, we could have just done this. And it's pretty expressive. We could say, hey, I just want to map the first two. And it turns out it's not specific to letters at all. We don't need letters there. Um, so we're just going to you know, map the first two here. And so I could, I could look at this and say, you know. I've got words, words, word, word, and I've got this whole ceremony around here. Um, I don't even really need any of that. I could just kind of call this inline, to be honest. It reads really well to me. Um, so map the first two of these things, and that'll work with anything. So there's just an example, probably kind of straw man-ish, but <laughs> uh, I just wanted to show you guys if you know underscore was a little bit more functional, we could do that. So. Um, Let's give us a point here uh, on our uh, normal functional style here um, for, for being able to remove all the data and be completely data generic there so it's reusable. Uh, and let's actually get another point um, just to drive it home that uh, you know there's way less code on the screen so it's more maintainable. Uh, and third, just because it didn't even need to exist in the first place. Um, all right. So underscores API prevents you from currying because the uh, arguments are backwards. Um, so that's kind of a bummer. Um, so yeah, there's currying. It's got, uh, you can make generic functions. It's like a, it's like a little function factory. And uh, you can get pretty, pretty terse and concise with your definitions. Uh, and it's good for composition, which we're about to talk about. Uh, does anybody have any questions about that before I go on? Because it's kind of important. All right, cool. <laughs> All right, so composition. Um, composition 
is, uh, let's see here. Well, it's in underscore, so that's great. Underscore has compose. Um, and uh, how many here, do you guys use compose? Here, show of hands, how many people use compose? All right, we've got almost a hand. <laughs> hey, all right, like four. Uh, how many people here use chain? Can you raise your hand if you use chain? Hey, like everybody, all right. <laughs> um, well, uh, yeah, chain is mentioned like so much throughout the documentation, and compose is mentioned in like the release notes and where it's defined. Um, so let's kind of go over what compose is. Um, so here, uh, you're pretty much gonna stick two functions together to get a new function. Uh, you're just composing them, and it'll run both functions right to left. Let's look at that a little closer here. Uh, so if you wanna write a really, really terribly inefficient uh, way to get the last element in an array, uh, you could do something like this. So we get uh, this last function that takes x's, that's our array, and we're gonna reverse them and grab the first one. Uh, so that'll be a good way to get the last. Um, but we can write that in another way. We could write it like this, uh, which is just the composition of reverse and first. And there's two, uh, well, let's see how it works real quick. Boom. Um, so we get the uh, last element because it reverses it and then uh, grabs the first one. So it almost runs right to left, passing the output of one function into the input of the next. Um, and you can use more than two functions, but uh, we'll keep it simple and stick with two. Uh, so there's, there's some key differences here. Um, in last, on the, the top version, uh, we actually uh, mention x's, of course, in a different way. So we're referring to arguments and data in that one. And the one under it, we're not at all. We're just saying glue these two functions together. Uh, and also, in the top one, we're specifying, we're actually baking in an order of evaluation for JavaScript. JavaScript can't evaluate it in a different way. It's like, I have to read uh, this top line first and then the next line. Um, but in our comp compose version, it's a uh, declarative. It just says, all right, well, you know, some other process is gonna handle this, um, so we're not gonna bake in order of evaluation. Um, even though we know it goes right to left and it passes the output in the next, JavaScript is like, okay, something else is gonna handle this. Uh, and it's, it's a way more declarative, higher level way of programming uh, leads to things like parallelization and stuff like that, if that's a word. <laughs> All right, so uh, here's another example, uh, just so we can wrap our heads around compose. Um, so we have this word count, a word count function. Uh, it takes a string, it splits on the spaces, and then we're gonna grab the length. Um, and so it'll tell us the uh, length of the words. And it's the same way to do it. Now notice here, uh, we're gonna partially apply split. So uh, split takes the spaces and it's still waiting for its string. And so when we call word count with the string that finishes split and runs it, and then the output of split goes into length. Uh, so partial application slash currying, um, you know, curried function can be partially applied. Uh, they kind of play together with composition because uh, you wanna just kind of make it so your, your data flows through this, this kind of chain of functions. So it's like chain, but backwards. Uh, and we don't have to wrap and unwrap data explicitly. Um, so uh, here's, a, here's a cool example of us. Um, you're actually able to uh, unnest functions with it because it's going to call replace first, then comment create. Well, if you compose them, it'll call the right one and then the left one. So it kind of cleans up nesting too, which I thought was cool to show. All right, uh, so here it goes. Category theory, shout out to John Bender. <laughs> so um, uh, there's an accurate uh, definition of what category theory is. <laughs> it's, uh, it's basically a mathematics around, uh, centered around uh, transforming values is the way I would say it in, a, in the terms that I understand. <laughs> so we've got uh, a couple of, uh, here's an example. All right, so these two circles on the left, uh, you're the one on the left and one in the middle, they're both, you know, type A, that's type person in this example. And the last one is the type B, which is, uh, I guess, it's like breakfast foods. Um, and G and F are functions. So if G and F are pure functions, every time I call G with John, I'll get Mary. Like every time, no matter what. Every time I call G with Mary, I get John. Uh, so you're just kind of connecting the dots there. And if I call, uh, you know, G then F, um, with Mary, I'm just gonna get eggs. You can just kind of follow the, the way the lines go. 
And we say we can just compose those, uh, and we can just cut out the middleman. Uh, and that's really useful, and there's a whole set of you know, formulas and, and things you can look up and learn that's actually applicable day to day. And this isn't that like, math isn't programming, stop using math and programming stuff. I mean, it's just you know, a useful guiding light that you can be like, oh, look at this. I'm just composing these two things. It's like a formula, and I can use this to help me. So uh, yeah, that little dot there, I should have mentioned, is the composition operator. Uh, and this stuff can get really complex. Uh, but it's really just connecting the dots at the end of the day. Uh, and you know, there's, there's some cool stuff down at the bottom It's demonstrating associativity, uh, where it doesn't matter if you group the GNF um, or the GNH first. Uh, you're always going to get the same results. Uh, so that's pretty cool. Um, so let's look at an example of composition. Okay, so we're gonna compare it against underscores chain because I think that's the de facto way to do this and everybody seems to use chain. So um, let's, let's take a look at this compared to the compose version of it. So we're gonna redefine sorted phones here and we're gonna say, all right, well, chain just wraps our users uh, so that we can call dot on it because we love calling dot on things and value just unwraps it. Well. So the only important stuff is right here, really. So let's grab that. Um, I'm just going to compose. And since it's backwards, we're going to compose the sort by, uh, and then the map. I don't know. I should learn Vim. <laughs> All right, so there we go. Um, now, that's a little bit off the screen on mine, but you can see it's, uh, that's, we're done. That's it. Uh, we don't need the, you know, the function wrapper and all that stuff. I should have left it for uh, reference. But uh, what's cool is since we're doing functional programming and we could, we could see that we've got a function that takes some argument and we're just calling dot phone functions and, you know, we're going to call dot on it. Why don't we make a dot function? We'll call that dot. We'll use our fancy auto curry here. And that's just going to take a property and an object, and we'll just use the bracket. So um, there we go. So now we can actually just call dot on phone and dot on our sign update. And that kind of cleans it up quite a bit. I feel like Bob Ross up here or something. <laughs> there we go. So isn't that lovely? Isn't that a beautiful? Beautiful way to clean this up. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> uh, so yeah, so there's there's a composition. It kind of gets rid of the wrapping and unwrapping and the ceremony of the functions. Uh, you can see all this extra stuff is gone. So uh, let's, let's get back to our lovely pointing system. Um, so we're at three to zero. We're gonna give it another point for being uh, completely uh, data generic once again in a different way. And then um, let's see. Let's. Uh, if you looked at it, it was actually, um, let's take another peek here. Uh, we've got, this is kind of programming in a declarative, almost like a formula. Uh, we're switching our mentality from, you know, the uh, sequence of events back to this kind of, we can, we can actually derive properties from that. And I think that's really important. And so uh, let's give us another point for that guy. Um, and another one, oh, I was, I was going to give me another one, but oh well. All right. So this is what, this is what our code at Loop Recur uh, looks like. That's where I work. We're always hiring. Come find me if you want to write this crazy stuff. Um, and almost everything is using Compose. Uh, so I just wanted to point that out. Like it's a really, it's, you know, it's a cornerstone of, of what we're doing. And um, this stuff really works. This is straight up production code. Um, poor clients, right? But um, here we go. <laughs> okay, so underscore promotes, promotes chain as the function of choice. And uh, you know, a lot of people tend to use that over uh, composition, which is a shame because composition has a whole math backing it, and uh, it's, you know, pretty powerful. Okay, composition. So you build new functions from other ones. Uh, you can have generic programs. Uh, it's really high-level coding. It's you know, totally declarative, uh, not really specifying sequence, and you got the math backing it. Okay, on to the heavy stuff. Take a break for a second. <laughs> All right. Are you guys still with me? I know it's like five something. All right. Hey, what's up? 
the question is, uh, can we compare performance? Um, I'd love for somebody to like, do some serious benchmarks. I, I don't care about performance, so I've just been writing code ignorantly and <laughs> just delivering it. What was that? Yeah, but it's, it's totally, I mean, it's been working fine for us, and, and I haven't had any real problems. So what's up? can I do what in JavaScript? Oh, no, you can't do Taylor recursion. Uh, but we're, we're using a set of, uh, you know, abstract functions that don't really, I mean, they might wrap loops or something in the background, but we're not doing explicit tail call recursion. Um, and I don't think there's a need to do that. I think you can use, uh, you know, patterns to capture the recursion um, or higher order functions. All right, into the functors. Okay, so, <laughs> um, this is, all right, who, who knows how to solve this problem? This is, you're trying to call plus one, you have an array, it wants an x, but it doesn't have an x. It has an array. So what do we do? How do we solve this? Yeah, you want to you wanna run over. You want to iterate over the list. Um, or do you say with lisp? <laughs> oh, we lift. Oh, yeah, that's way better. OK, well, you're, too, you're way too advanced. <laughs> All right. So anyway, we're going to iterate over this uh, array. Um, and we could just, we could just map, map the function over it. And we get a four back. Uh, so so uh, I know a lot of people probably have done this. You know, you guys use map, right? Who uses map? Anybody? All right, great, awesome. So we're all using map, and map's great, uh, and and that solves this problem. Well, if you look at it a little bit closer, yes, it's like we are lifting this plus one into the array. Uh, if you look over at the kind of grayed out, it's like we put it inside there, and we're running the function on it, and then it comes back out as a four. Uh, and if we remove the syntactic sugar which uh, I just realized that that's probably not going to work. But let's pretend it does. Uh, if you give it multiple arguments, it makes an array. If you give it one, it makes a blank one with that length. But anyway, so we remove the syntactic sugar. And uh, you know, it's the same thing. So could we do this with any object? Let's see, is map more abstract than just working on arrays? And we certainly can. Uh, so let's, let's talk about that. All right, so how would it work? Well, if you wanted to map a function over my object, what it would probably happen is it would kind of take what's out you know, from inside my object and pass it into the function. Uh, and I could run any function uh, over my object, and it would actually you know, open it up, run the function on the contents, and then close it back up for me. Uh, and that's exactly the intuition you should have when you're thinking of map. I'm going to map this function over, over this object. It's like I put my value in a bubble, and I have to open up the bubble and run the function on it and close it back up. So let's see what this looks like um, a little closer. So we're going to add, you know, add one to that three there. Um, and if my, my object is just a constructor, um, you know, we can, and we just arbitrarily pick val just to refer to the value inside it. Um, well, if we define map for it, it would look just like the, the comment up there. We're just going to run the function over the val. So uh, and this is kind of a distinct difference of how we treat um, types in functional programming from the objects. Uh, we're really going to look at you know, the objects as containers or contexts for our values. Uh, and then we can use them to dynamically dispatch our functions on them. Uh, so we're going to look at this a little bit closer. Uh, but basically, uh, we get to define map on anything, uh, and by defining map on an object, that object becomes a functor. Um, all it is is an uh, interface is, you know, if you define map, you have a functor. Okay, uh, so let's look at some actual useful practic uh, applications of this. Um, so up here we have our, our friend maybe, uh, and the very top line there, we're going to map plus one over our maybe, and it's just going to add one to it. And uh, the middle line, it says maybe null, and it actually doesn't do anything. It just ignores it. And that's the behavior of maybe. Maybe says, um, I might have this value, or I might not have this value. Um, and if I don't, don't even run the function. Just return me the maybe back. And we can just define this really easily by saying, if you've got a value, run it. If you don't, don't. So that's a pretty cool thing. Uh, it's basically uh, the null check, but abstracted into a functor. So if you, have an ob or if you have a value, let's say a number or an object or anything, and you put it inside a maybe, uh, you basically are forced to map over it. You can't just run your function on your value anymore. It's inside the maybe. 
So you have to map over that, just like we saw with the list. And that gives you some kind of like dynamic type safety that's really interesting to me. Um, we'll look at that a little bit more. Uh, so here's another one. This is uh, either. And uh, the way either works is it kind of takes two parameters. One, the one on the left would be its, its first parameter would be its uh, default value. And its second one is, is the value that we're going to use. So um, if it's there. So the top line there, uh, we're going to map plus one over that either. And because it has that, that second value, it's going to use that one. So we get either one and three, because it added one to that two. And then on the second line, uh, since it doesn't have its, its value uh, on the right, it's going to just use its default, its first argument. You guys see that? Is that being kind of confusing? No? <laughs> All right, so if you, if you look at it either as a left and a right, and you call its left argument its default, and its right is the one that's going to get uh, given to it, it'll actually use the right one if it has it, and it won't if it, it'll just use the default. So it's an abstraction over default values almost. Or you could use it to do pure uh, error checking and stuff. But this is kind of how you'd implement that. You'd say, hey, if I have my right value, uh, just run the function on it. Uh, and if I don't, run it on the left value. And so I get defaults. Um, so I also wanted to point out there's all this promise stuff going on. And <laughs> everybody's freaking out about promises. Uh, well, if you just suggest that um, promises are functors, and all you have to do is map something over it, um, that Ajax get posts, you know, if that returns a promise, I'm just going to map populate table over that eventual value. You know, I didn't really want to get too far into this, but it's pretty kick ass. Like, it's the intuition is there. I don't need to learn about then and when and on and all the different libraries. I can just map over it, and it's a unified API. Uh, yes. Okay. <laughs> uh, so let's look at an example here. Um, all right. It's 5:26. Make, the, make, make this happen. Let's make this count. <laughs> All right. So here um, we're going to get some random ass div up here. And uh, we've got our function, let's, or our program. Let's look at this. So update greeting HTML uh, is going to take the current user. Uh, we're going to call it get greeting first, because that's how compose works. And that's going to pass the user into get greeting and call dot name on it. You guys remember dot from the other example? It's pretty cool. Um, and uh, then we're going to concat welcome to that. So you, you end up with something like, you know, uh, welcome, Bob. So that's a pretty cool thing in that it sets the HTML of our div after you get that string. Uh, so what happens when we don't have a current user? Uh, the user isn't logged in yet. Uh, well. You know, how do you even null check up here? We just saw that with this thing called maybe. Uh, so let's, let's say I'm going to put my uh, current user in a maybe. And I actually can't run this, you know, this function on uh, my maybe anymore. It doesn't take a maybe. It takes a user. Uh, so what I have to do is map over it. So let's just map this function over that. And I'm done. Uh, and none of my program changed. Um, and that's pretty awesome, right? Uh, so, so all I've done is say, I don't know if I have this view user or not. Let's just wrap it on a maybe and map over it. Uh, and let's say our boss comes back and he's like, you, you guys, it's missing the whole welcome banner. You know, if they're not logged in, it doesn't say anything. But we could say, well, why don't we use either? We'll say either, and then we'll just make some kind of, you know, blanky. There we go. And now it says welcome blanky. Uh, so that's, that's, you know, we've changed the value uh, going into our app. This is the calling code. This, this is our app up here, you know, from here to there. Uh, and this is just the, the caller there. So, uh, and notice that this doesn't mention that data. You know, we, we've been, we spent half this talk just removing data from our app and just gluing functions together and partially applying them. And we're not really making any references uh, to it. And now, this data that doesn't exist in our app is getting wrapped and making our app work differently. How crazy is that? That's like, you know, really powerful. So I uh, just wanted to point that out. And if, you know, this user wasn't there yet, let's say they're coming from the database and, you know, we've got this promise there, it would work exactly the same way. I just wanted to throw promises in there. Sound cool. <laughs> All right. Um, 
So there's that. Uh, let's give us more points. <laughs> and do we get to eight? No, we don't get to eight. OK, so underscore explicitly prevents extending map. It even checks to see if you've defined map on your object. And then it's like, no, it's not the native map. Uh, so it's funny that it does that check. And if it has a map, it actually has to map, uh, match the native one. So uh, if you look at the map defined in underscore, it's going to work on arguments, objects, and arrays. Uh, but you know, we'd have to get in there and mess with it to change it. And here, um, you know, it's just a functor interface. I should be able to define map uh, as a functor. So that's not very functional at all. It's, it's a bummer. Um, <laughs> All right, so that's uh, functors. And it's not just map. Um, there's reduce, there's compose even. Uh, there's a type class for that. You can uh, do all sorts of great stuff. Um, and uh, let's see, you've got, um, uh, there's formulas associated with map that you can derive and use in the whole functor laws. Uh, and that dynamic type safety we were talking about. Um, if I know a value is going into my app, and it may or may not be there, or it'll eventually be there in the case of a promise. I could just wrap that in a uh, maybe or a promise or whatever, and the rest of my app is forced to deal with it because it can't get to the value without mapping over it. And that's crazy awesome. That forces you guys to be like, oh, well, all right, let's map over this, and it just works. I don't, I don't have to make those mistakes anymore. Um, all right, uh, that's pretty much my talk. So in conclusion, um, wow, I'm clocking in pretty early here. <laughs> It gives us some time for talks. Um, so in conclusion, um, I was going to say a thing or two about, uh, you know, I think underscore could be a lot more functional. And uh, we do love it. We do use it. I, you know, I think there's other libraries that are just as good. But um, you know, it's great to have a standard. And uh, I wish we had a standard uh, library that we could use for functional programming. Uh, and we started one called score under. Uh, <laughs> just to be cheeky, <laughs> because it reverses the arguments. Anyway, um, <laughs> I'll, uh, yeah, so if you check out Lupercur's GitHub, um, there should be a score under there. If there's not, I'll put it up tonight. Um, but I was hoping we'd get some more open source effort, because uh, I think, you know, next time uh, I'd love to talk about traversable and lenses. And, uh, you know, I think this point free and these type class talks are great, and, and I hope more people get into it. Um, and I hope we build a bigger community because it's really small right now and clients are like, I can't believe you gave me this app. This is crazy. Uh, <laughs> so does anybody have any questions or just want to shoot the crap because we got some time? What's up? OK, so like, what, what should the API be if you were going to create a? Oh, that's a really good question. Um, as a matter of fact, uh, so, so we use, it's, it's weird. When you're programming functionally, you kind of want the world to be a function, like everything to be a function. Um, and so we found ourselves wrapping the entire array, uh, built-in array stuff and string stuff. And um, all it does is auto curry and put its argument last, its array or string last. Uh, and it works fine. I mean, it might be terribly unperformant, but it might, I mean, it seems to be all right for me. <laughs> uh, so uh, I shouldn't be saying these things. Um, <laughs> no, it's, it's been fine. It's in production code. They're big clients, and everybody's happy, so it's no big deal. And we end up with really small, maintainable, and parallelizable programs, so it's, it's really cool. We usually uh, make mobile apps, so you can uh, do that on that. So. Uh, yeah, I would, to answer your question about uh, what kind of functions would you like to see, I think, I think just the few uh, standard, you know, like map filter reduce and, and things like that, like those, those are great. And um, the array and string uh, extensions to be able to program uh, functionally. And uh, I'll, I'll compose that works correctly because the order of evaluation in JavaScript, it kind of messes up a, f a formula or two for you, uh, even though it's associ associative. You can group as many uh, functions as you want inside Compose, uh, but it doesn't actually evaluate them in the right order uh, when you give it multiple arguments and stuff. So that's interesting. Uh, so um, I originally actually started uh, doing score under by taking underscore, running through each of the functions, flipping the arguments, and calling auto curry on them. And uh, that, was, that was kind of a, I thought it would be cool because underscore could keep updating and it would just like change it. Um, 
but uh, then we ended up using Lodash and t tweaking that, and now we're just kind of, uh, I don't know where it is, but <laughs> it's out there. Uh, but the, I don't think it's more than, than the normal library. Just all we did was get in there and mess with Lodash, so it's the same size as Lodash at this point. Um, I love that I'm talking about Lodash, even though it's an underscore talk. <laughs> all right. Um, so is, is anybody going to that class on Wednesday? All right, cool. Hey, what's going on? How did you, oh man, I gotta talk to you after this. <laughs> did you have a question over there? That's a good question. You know what, I haven't, I should, I should uh, totally troll him. I mean, not, <laughs> no, uh, I think the thing is that, you know, in, in JavaScript, you're gonna get these, like, it looks right to put your, your um, you know, function last. Like, that's what looks right to people. And so I think when we're like, oh, well, this is functional, and you know this is is object oriented, you know like it's not it's not functional. <laughs> you know like, this is so. I mean maybe it is. I guess it is technically, but I think it could be a lot better. Is all I'm saying. And so I, I should write, but I think a lot of people would probably be like, currying is too confusing without type signatures, which is why we add type signatures all the time in comments. Um, and I've got a thing or two to say about that, but I don't want to waste too much time. So. But anyway, I think that's all I got so far. Anybody else? All right. I'll see you guys later. Thank you. <laughs>